And hello, welcome everyone to our discussion today of uh, turbulent flow, uh, mod turbulence modeling. And today we're going to talk, talk about uh, Nicaragua's paper, Laws of Flow in Rough Pipes. So if you want a TLDR version, basically, uh, yeah, um, it's going to talk about this B factor, um, factor that uh, we were talking about in the last video. And it basically says that this, uh, it's probable, it looks, it looks right that this HS is uh, HS, not HS plus. This HS is pretty much the epsilon we are talking about. I'll show you where in the paper. And of course, this paper does give you some interesting insight into, um, into the how uh, the way roughness interacts with the boundary layers and why we have different regimes. So, okay, maybe I, I'll start with that first, but I just gave you the TLDR version. So I'm gonna, gonna start a little bit with boundary layers again before going into the text. So remember in the flat plate boundary layer flow, you have this uh, uh, turbulent flow, the turbulent flow, and then uh, inside, even inside the boundary layer, we have a few separate regions. We have the viscous sublayer, and then we have some transition region into the fully turbulent layer. Okay, fully turbulent layer. Uh, let me give you that. Yeah, fully turbulent layer. So remember, in the fully turbulent layer over here this is where the log law goes and then this is where u plus u plus equals to y plus let's just say revision for you now okay so this is all assuming this this surface is smooth right all right so i'll just explain briefly then we'll i'll show you the the line of thought inside uh, uh, Nicaragua's paper. So in the smooth region, all right. So this is assuming this uh, this uh, what do you call it? This uh, surface is smooth, right? In the smooth region, you have the laminar flow like so. In let's say we, we have a look at Moody's chart. You have this laminar flow like so. Whether it is smooth or rough, it's kind of the same. Then of course in the turbulence region, it has like the lowest friction factor as of all of them so this is a very smooth pipe fully smooth pipe will, will be this bottom line that you see here okay as the roughness increases you kind of go upwards but uh, you see kind of uh, three different regimes right one one regime is of course this smooth regime completely smooth regime the other regime is that where you kind of have a little bit of difference between the smooth regime and the rough regime so the smooth regime uh, you you see this um, you'll see this uh, decreasing uh, Reynolds uh, decreasing friction factor with the Reynolds number okay however there's some transition re uh, region from here until when it's um, when the Reynolds number increases enough you will have this um, flat region over here and the logic is as follows okay so in Prentel's I mean in Nicaragua's paper I can show you where later but I'll just show you at least via um, via uh, paint now so let's see let's see what happens with the rough regions right the rough regions all right, so let's say we have a rough plate, okay? This is rough, okay? And we have this jagged edge to, that is my indication to show that it's rough. Now, if you have a laminar flow, let's say you, you, you have this first part where you have laminar flow, then you have this parabolic uh, flow profile. Apparently, uh, in the laminar regime, in the laminar regime, um, there seems to be no effect. Okay. 
no effect. All right. There seems to be no effect on the friction factor when it comes to laminar flow. So, I mean, where else do we see this laminar flow effect happening? There's no, uh, yeah, where else do we see laminar flow? All right, where else do we see laminar flow? flow? In this viscous sublayer, we can also consider this to be a laminar flow regime because the viscous forces are much more than the uh, inertial forces. So, the idea is this, all right? If your surface roughness is all submerged in this uh, laminar region, right? If your surface roughness is in the laminar region, whether it's in a fully laminar flow or ma it's managed to be uh, below this uh, viscous slab layer thickness, if your surface roughness is below this, uh, is uh, completely covered by the viscous sublayer regime, then we can sort of say that, you know, um, yeah, then we can also sort of say that even though the flow for the most part is turbulent, well, the flow for the most part is turbulent, as long as the roughness is small enough, I mean, no, no pipe is completely smooth, right? There will always be defects and jagged edges. But so long as the, the pipe is smooth enough, um, the effects of this roughness can be neglected because all of it is in the viscous sublayer. Okay? So if we look at our Moody pipe, Moody chart, we will see, you know, um, over here especially, if you see this part, a lot of the curves are bunched rather closely together regardless of uh, regardless of what roughness they are except of course unless your roughness is really really high um, if your roughness is pretty small then the the curves are bunched really close together so friction factor difference is not so much why is that so um, it's because likely because the roughness level is comparable to the the thickness of the viscous sublayer. If not, it is completely submerged. All right. In some of uh, Moody charts, yeah, in some of the Moody charts, you see that uh, for very low surface roughness, again, uh, all of them. I mean, after below a certain Reynolds number, they kind of um, kind of merge into this portion called smooth tubes. So you can see, and this one's from Paris Chemical Engineering Handbook. So if you get that or some other source, resource, you should see, you know, um, even even uh, at lower Reynolds numbers, it doesn't matter what, as long as your roughness is low enough, they can be considered smooth. Why is that so? Um, it is basically because of this phenomena. Uh, it depends on the thickness of this viscous sublayer in relation to the... Um, in, in uh, comparison to the height of these roughness elements or the height of the how jagged these edges are so if you can imagine the the edge has some some uh, some like mountains or something it's like uh, microscopic mountains these rough edges so the smallest part will have some height difference from the the peak of these mountains so this will be I mean the character uh, it will be, of course, a statistical distribution of these heights, and the representative um, height will be called Hs. If not, we can use epsilon to represent the surface roughness height. Okay, so uh, in low with the low Reynolds number regime, low Reynolds number. Okay, what can we expect? We can expect that the viscous sublayer is thicker. So this means that it has, well, the viscous sublayer is able to cover a wider range of surface roughness. If you have a high Reynolds number, for example, okay, I'm going to stretch this out, go, save and, okay. I'll replace that. 
Okay, so yeah, if you have a high Reynolds number, you have a thinner vi viscous sublayer, and therefore. Some of the roughness, if the roughness is big enough, the viscous sublayer now it starts to become thinner so that these roughness elements will protrude in the turbulence, in the turbulence regime. Okay. This roughness elements will protrude in the turbulence regime, and then you will have you will have what we call I mean an increase in the friction factor. So uh, if you were to see this uh, line or you were to see this uh, Moody chart from the the uh, Paris Chemical Engineering Handbook, as you increase the Reynolds number, it starts to matter. You know uh, that we have small degrees of roughness. For example, 0 0.00001. Okay, all, all these uh, relative roughness, uh, they will start to come into effect. Of course, diameter is important here because that will uh, determine the the bulk Reynolds number and how thick your viscous sublayer is. That's why you have epsilon over d, and that will help to determine you know the the, the relative size of the roughness element. Um, uh, compared to the viscous sublayer, so with a bigger diameter, uh, of course that means that, uh, yeah, if you have a bigger diameter, maybe you have a th thicker viscous sublayer. If uh, if you have a smaller diameter, it means perhaps the flow is more forceful. I, I guess you can one way you can think about that one way, but uh, the I may have uh, said that yeah, I mean I don't know. How, have phrased that a little off, but the bottom line is, uh, if this uh, surface roughness, uh, these little mountains, they start uh, penetrating into this, uh, into this, um, the turbulent regimes, not the viscous regime, then we start to see an increase in uh, friction factor. Then what about this flat part which you see on this uh, diagram here? The flat part is basically okay after a while you increase the Reynolds number so much that the viscous sublayer becomes so so thin so Delta becomes much less than the the viscous sublayer the viscous sublayer Delta the thickness of this viscous sublayer becomes much 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 lower than the, the the average height of this surface roughness element so that even if you increase even if you increase the Reynolds number if you increase the Reynolds number then this thing will just become smaller and then well it doesn't really make a difference because the amount of roughness actually penetrating the turbulence layers and causing extra friction is the same so no matter how much you increase the Reynolds number the friction factor is going to be the same okay so that is what uh, this regime, this flat regime on this particular Moody chart is talking about. So that that's all. Um, hopefully that, that that kind of clears up the confusion. And this is one of the key points of uh, um, Nikaratze's paper. So let me show you his train of thought. Now I'm, I'll get into this paper after 14 minutes of talking, but that actually uh, helps to highlight some of the important points. So this is his paper. And then, yeah, you have his abstract and literature review. So, okay, uh, just just some things to note for this paper. Uh, he uses lambda uh, for this uh, friction factor. He doesn't use k, okay? He doesn't use k as what you would see over here, for example. Okay, here, here, you, here he uses lambda, which is the same. Uh, but sometimes we like to use F or K or whatever okay so this is this is the F and of course relative roughness uh, they use a K here but in Paris chemical engineering handbook they like to use the, the term epsilon okay so uh, yeah epsilon over D is over here 
yeah so that's that's is it okay so next uh, next important thing let's go and look at this paper um, so you have a, we have a certain formula for uh, the Reynolds um, Reynolds number and relative roughness so friction factor is a function of the Reynolds number and the relative roughness uh, this was from R von Mises what is K here? K is the uh, epsilon which we are talking about just now the roughness this K is the average depth of the roughness R is the radius of the pipe so of course do note that in modern Moody charts we like to use diameter instead of uh, radius so there will be some some differences there but more or less they're talking about uh, the size of the pipe so in that regard they are more or less the same of course we use different metrics of course yeah uh, the Reynolds number is being used here okay so there are different correlations for different flow, flow regimes so we'll just skip this part because this actually talks about uh, you know previous work with some of the um, uh, Reynolds number correlations with friction factor for example if it's a non-circular non-circular pipe we have a hydraulic radius of the channel to kind of measure what was the equivalent radius okay so this formula applies to iron pipes cement checkered plates and wire mesh etc etc so uh, yeah and then the, this one this one of course it's uh, early on they, they didn't have uh, such uh, advanced techniques or they would say that oh, okay the friction factor for the rough pipe is some constant multiplied into the friction factor for smooth pipe of course when it comes to la uh, later later um, later uh, iterations we, we do see development here and and we, we have more uh, complex formulas to and charts like what Moody has put here to display all the data all, all of this uh, individual experimental data in one smooth graph which is very easy to use in comparison to looking experiment by experiment so okay so there were more experiments done, more experiments done. Okay, so now this is the experiment that uh, um, Nikaratsi has done or is doing. Okay, so he's calculating some uh, using a water tank. So he's using a water flow through pipe at various Reynolds number and various roughness. He's trying to control the temperature so uh, okay so he describes his experimental setup and of course temperature is important because that works that will slightly um, affect some of the properties of water such as the density viscosity etc so as far as possible you want to keep the temperature constant so skip 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 okay he tells you how the pressure gradient is measured Okay, so this is the PDX equals to P1 minus P2 over L uh, for that. Then it talks about preliminary tests. Again, we will skip. We'll just go straight to this thing called law of resistance. Okay, so he, he starts talking about friction factor. And uh, what kind of friction factor is this? We see that uh, in the laminar regime, the friction factor is 64 over the Reynolds number. Okay, so I'm skipping lots of the parts of the paper. I just bring you to the juicy bits, the important bits. So this is 64 over Reynolds number. So uh, this is very consistent with, let's say, this Darcy uh, Darcy plot. Okay, is a uh, if I'm not wrong, Darcy friction factor. Okay, so if you look at thermal thermopedia. Um, there are many friction factors uh, hopefully you would have known them already uh, okay let's see so you see um, this one's the Moody friction factor Moody friction factor is uh, in laminar flow it is uh, 64 over the Reynolds number this is from the Moody diagram 
Okay, so Moody fr uh, friction factor is four times the fanning friction factor. There is also the Darcy friction factor. Okay, so now this is the Darcy friction factor. It is just a constant multiple of the Fanning friction factor. Okay, so. Okay. Okay, so according to this this site called Neutrium dot net, the friction factor difference between Fanny and Darcy is uh, the Fanning or uh, Darcy friction factor equals to four times the Fanning friction factor. So there's uh, of course this uh, classic confusion online, or even when you take your first fluid mechanics class. Uh, this is just a recap on that. Fanning friction factor and Darcy friction factor they are just different by a constant of four. Of course, what this uh, what this uh, neutrium.net calls a Darcy friction factor. This uh, what do you call that? Where is this? Yeah, this uh, engineering toolbox they call it the Moody friction factor. Okay, so um, it is used in the Darcy Weiss Weisbach. Uh, major loss equation. So this is also the Darcy friction factor. Okay, so this, these two are these two are slightly different, so just, just take note of them. Uh, what what how we can tell it, whether it's a Darcy or Moody friction factor? You just look at the laminar regime. If the laminar regime is um, 64 over Reynolds number, okay, this one I can cancel out. Yeah, if you look at the Moody's chart here, provided by this neutrium.net, uh, we see that in the laminar regime, the, the friction factor is 64 over the Reynolds number. So that's how we, if we look at the laminar regime, we can roughly tell whether it's talking about the Moody friction factor or uh, Fanning friction factor. Okay, so Moody friction factor and Darcy friction factor are the same thing. In the laminar regime, they are 64 over the Reynolds number. So that's something that we want to just be mindful of. Okay, just want to be very mindful of that. Uh, so that's how looking at the laminar regime is how we can tell um, whether we are talking about Darcy or Moody or Fanning friction factor. Okay, so this one, in this case, this is the Darcy or Moody friction factor where in the laminar regime, lambda equals to 64 over the Reynolds number. Uh, or where you have F, F Darcy, friction Darcy friction factor. Okay, so if uh, we have a smooth pipe, then uh, lambda will just be, or the friction factor Darcy friction factor will just be a um, um, co constant multiplied into one o uh, one over one over fourth power of the Reynolds number. Okay, so I'll just uh, keep going. All right, so yeah, so this is this is the part I was talking about. Okay, the three ranges of the curves lambda equals to some function of the Reynolds number might be physically interpreted as follows. In the first range, the thickness delta of the laminar boundary layer, or the viscous sublayer as we like to call it, because the viscous when it, when the sublayer is viscous enough. The flow regime is laminar. So in this first range, um, this is uh, this viscous sublayer. It is known to decrease with increasing Reynolds number, similar to what I was talking to you just now about in in that little diagram, uh, this drawing there. However, this uh, delta, this uh, viscous sublayer thickness, is still bigger than the average projection. Here it's saying it's bigger than the, the surface roughness. That's what I was talking about. Therefore, energy uh, losses due to roughness are no greater than those for the smooth pipe. Meaning to say, at, at a certain regime, you, you saw those where those curves were bunched very closely to, together. 
uh, that's because the viscous sublayer was thicker than the, the, the height of the surface roughness element. Second range is where the thickness of the boundary layer is of the same magnitude as the average projection. So this is where surface roughness starts to kick in. So that's why it is important. And then with, um, and then it says here in this regime, as Reynolds number increases, increasing number of projections pass through the laminar boundary layer. So what, what is he talking about? When the thing is partially exposed, and then you increase the Reynolds number, more of these uh, roughness elements get uh, protrude into the turbulent regime. Therefore, you have more and more, uh, more and more, uh, more and more roughness elements uh, of those little mountains protruding into the turbulent regime and causing extra friction. So that's what he is talking about here. So this is the key finding I was elaborating on in the first part of this video. Finally, in the third range, the range of the roughness of the boundary layer has become so small that all protrusions extend through it. This is what I was talking about in this third regime where the surface roughness thickness or height becomes much more than the viscous sublayer uh, thickness. So that as you increase this Reynolds number, it doesn't really matter because all the surface roughness um, uh, has been exposed and then you have this flat part of the curve here. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. Okay, so he'll give you some uh, expressions for this. I'm not going to um, deal too much with that. What's more important is is this part where it's it's uh, talking about the uh, velocity profile. So this is actually found. This is actually found uh, over here. Okay, uh, when okay, this is actually found over here. Is this the one? Wait, hold on. No, that's not right. Uh, it is found in this section called velocity distribution. Yes, uh, look at this velocity uh, velocity distribution. You just scroll down a little bit more, and then you'll find some familiar numbers over here. Eight point four eight. Okay, so u over u star or v star. V star here is the friction velocity, as the, we defined it earlier. So v star equals to 8.48 plus 5.75 log y over k. So this is in some uh, regime. So a plus b log y over k. So this is very similar to what was being talked about here. You have a number 8.48 over here. And then you have uh, some other numbers as well. They're not exactly the same. You'll, you will know why shortly. Okay, so if we scroll down a little bit more, we'll see eta over here. Eta is actually y times the friction velocity over the viscosity. So this, is, this eta is actually the same as y plus over here. So you see the y plus here, it is being called eta over here. Okay, the, so the, hopefully that clears up some confusion. And of course, uh, you'll be wondering whether this log is it a uh, log base 10, log base e, which is a natural logarithm or some other logarithm. That will be found out shortly as well. Um, so just skip all this part. I'll show you the end after a lot of derivation, blah, 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 you can go and read it in your own time. We see this uh, region, yes. We see this very important, uh, this very important uh, regime here. Okay, so let's compare slowly one, one regime at a time. Okay, so what is the formula here? We say we have this, uh, in different regimes, we have different uh, values of a and what is a a is this thing 2.83 over square root of lambda minus 5.75 log blah 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 this whole lot is a so what we have here is the normalized velocity minus 5.75 log y over k equals this whole thing here and this whole thing which i'm highlighting now that is the same as a you see 
2.83 over square root lambda minus 5.75 log r over k minus beta and it is exactly the same here so what what you're seeing is u over v star or u over the friction velocity equals or minus 5.75 log of y over k equals to this constant a of course if we if we take a look and compare between here and here we see that uh, it's slightly different because this is a, a natural logarithm for sure and here we use y plus over hs plus of course if we if we do the same normalization to the numerator and denominator it is exactly the same so what we find out here is that this hs we talk about here it is pretty much the same as the uh, surface roughness k over here okay so y over k here y plus over hs plus here so that that shows that the hs plus is, is the same as this y over k okay so uh, there is more evidence to that so remember the first regime where we say that uh, uh, the pipe the pipe is kind of smooth so you have a logarithm of this uh, H, hs plus because this is k k is the surface roughness height which is hs or epsilon you normalize it using the friction velocity and the viscosity then you will get uh, this expression for the first part log uh, when this uh, logarithm is from 0 to 0 0.55 you'll have this expression for a okay so if you do uh, 10 to the power of 0 or exponential 0 then you remove the log here you will get this dimensionless coefficient is from 1 to something to the power of 0 0.55 so let's try 10 to the power of 0 0.55 to see whether it's a natural logarithm it's a log base 10 long exponential 0 0.55 so what I'm doing here is basically, okay, I see this log over here and I'm trying to compare to this thing over here because both of these look very, very similar. You see a 5.5 at the front here. You also see a 5.5 at the front here. One, one could of course postulate that this, this B over here, this B coefficient here, it is what is stated here in A. So 10 to the power of 0 0.55, what is it? It is 3.548. Okay, 3.548. So 3.548. Keep that number in mind. Here is 3.5. So that shows that uh, this this first this first line here is corresponding to this line of data over here, where a equals to 5.5 plus 5.75 logarithm of um, the non -di the dimensionless. Uh, hs okay i'll continue this in the next video because it's getting a little long but thanks for watching i'll see you guys again bye bye